Hi everyone, and welcome to the Ultimate Guide to Color Mixing. I'm so excited to bring this lesson to you because with these demonstrations we're gonna do, you are investing in the most important skill an artist can have. That may sound like a big exaggeration when you think of all the different skills an artist needs, but an artist's greatest asset is their eyes. The skill doesn't come from learning all the techniques or all the fancy ways of putting down paint. Skill is having eyes that are trained to notice more and more distinction, to see more subtle distinctions between things. So as an artist, what you're a professional at is paying attention. So artists get the honor to ask questions like, what are the exact colors of this sunset that I'm looking at? Or how would I paint the effect of that road on a rainy day? Or what is making that person's eyes just seem to glitter and sparkle? You as an artist are an investigator and you're trying to solve the mysteries of this amazing visual world around us. So how does color mixing improve your artist's eye? Well, you're going to learn to compare colors. These two reds you may be looking at are similar to each other, but one has more yellow in it. Or this blue is more vivid compared to this dull looking green. And this is how you create every visual effect in the world. So whether you're painting an apple or the aurora borealis, everything comes down to seeing the differences between colors that are right next to each other. I'm excited to be learning this alongside you. Let's dive into the ultimate guide to color mixing. So to start off, let's take a look at our materials list. To begin with, we have our palette knife, and you'll notice that you will not need a brush for anything we're gonna do in the upcoming lessons. All of your mixing is gonna be done with this guy. And so if you've never used a palette knife before, don't worry, I'll teach you the basics of how to use it, and by the end of these lessons, you will have a lot of experience using this. Then you're gonna need paper towels or rags, just something that you can use to clean off the palette knife with. You're gonna need a palette of some sort to mix your paints on. Doesn't really matter what kind of palette, just anything you can use to mix paint. And then we've got our paints. And so we have three different colors, the primaries, yellow, red, and blue. And then we're also going to need white. And the specific colors I'm using, Hansa Yellow Light, Naphthol Red, Ultramarine Blue, the specific color doesn't really matter. Just make sure you have some kind of yellow, red, and blue. The reason why I specifically use these are because I try to paint with um, all natural pigments that don't have any toxicity to them. So if you're an oil painter, you might have cadmium yellow, you might have cadmium red, cobalt blue, something like that. And those are absolutely great. These are the specific colors that I use so that I um, don't have to use anything that has any toxicity to it. All right, so let's get color mixing. The first thing we're gonna do is lay out our paints onto the palette. And the way that I lay these out for demonstrations like this is to put them in a triangle shape. I like to put red at the top and squeeze out buku paint. We're going to use lots and lots of paint in this demonstration. So don't be scared to use this stuff. You have to use paint in order to get better at it. And I know it's scary sometimes when you buy this nice tube of paint that's so expensive. Maybe you're finally getting into artist grade and away from the cheap stuff. But it's critical that you learn to use your materials to the utmost. And the only way that you can do that is by squeezing out a lot of paint, by wasting paint.
it's even a little painful for me to squeeze out all of this paint because this is definitely not the first take of this lesson that I've done. So I have squeezed a lot of these bad boys out even just to make this video. Of course, I'm going to use the paint that I've already mixed in other takes of this, but you gotta use your paint. You're gonna be glad that you squeezed out a lot of paint at the start of this because what you don't want is to run out and then have to try and mix and match some really weird color. It's better to mix too much than too little. All right, so I've got my primary colors laid out in a triangle, and then I've got some white up in the corner that I can pull from as we go through the lessons. And a good place to start is to talk about these primary colors. We've all heard that the primary colors are red, blue, and yellow. And you've probably heard that they're called primary colors because out of these colors, you can mix absolutely any color in the rainbow. There's actually more to the definition of primary color than that though. The real meaning of a primary color is that these are all colors that you cannot get by mixing other colors. So what I'm saying is the color red can't be created by mixing any two colors together. So it's a primary color. Now, I would argue that's actually not 100% true, but I'm going to save that issue for another very interesting video that I hope you watch. So for this, our working definition of primary colors is that these guys cannot be created from anything else. They're the primo colors. And out of all of these, you can make everything. So by mixing these together, what we're gonna end up with is the color wheel. And look at me, I'm being sparse with my paint already. I'm being too cautious. Really load it down. And I hope that you're mixing alongside me through all of these demonstrations. All of these lessons, I'm going to be mixing in real time. That way you can do this next to me. Because the value of these exercises really, really comes by watching and doing it yourself, not just watching. So a quick discussion on my technique for using the palette knife. This is something that I learned from my mentor, is that when you're mixing colors with the palette knife, it's good to point the palette knife down and kind of push into the paint. Scoop it up, push into the paint, scoop it up. I think the common way of mixing with a palette knife is just to put the flat part down and kind of swirl it. If that works for you, that is totally fine. But if you're looking for a method to use the palette knife, I would suggest starting with that. Point it down and use that springy part to push down. Scoop it up and push it back down. Mix this yellow and red. And what I'm doing right now by mixing these is I'm creating what's called the secondary colors in the color wheel. The secondary colors are orange, green, and purple. And these are the ones that you get by mixing equal amounts of the primary colors together. Now, when I say equal amounts, I don't mean that I'm using exactly the same amount of red and the exactly the same amount of yellow to get orange. If I did that because of the nature of paint, um, red would probably just dominate and take over because paints have different strengths to them. But what I mean is equal yellowishness going into equal reddishness is going to make the color orange. Now, if you look over here at the purple, you'll see that I created a color that's real, real dark. And it's almost so dark that I can't even really tell what hue is going on. 
So there's a certain method that we can do to judge this color purple to see if it's the one we really like. What you can do is you can take a dab of this purple that we've mixed together and then take a dab of the white. Mix those two and then the color of that purple is going to actually pop out. And then I can take a look at that and say, okay, well, does this purple kind of look like it's right in between the red and the blue? And I, I think that's good enough for our purposes. But that's a good way to judge your hue. Now, I think I'm just throwing out the word hue, and I want to explain to you what I mean by that. When I say hue, I mean every color of the rainbow the real strong stark colors red orange yellow those are hues and you'll understand why i use that specific term a little bit later when we get into what happens when a red starts becoming more desaturated or if it starts looking a little bit more orange colored or something then that definition hue is going to be more valuable So now that we have our color wheel, we can talk about the next principle of color mixing, which is color temperature. Each of these colors is either a warm color or a cool color. And if I were to draw a line right in between the color wheel, we have a line dividing the warm from the cool colors. Over here, you've got your warm colors, yellow, orange, and red. And then on the other side, you have your cool ones, green, blue, and violet. At the very top of each of these wheels, from the dividing line, you have the warmest and coolest tones. So for our purposes, orange is the warmest color on the color wheel. And directly across from that, blue is our coolest color. So if we've got a warmest color on this color wheel and a coolest color, what that means is that each of these colors is warmer or cooler than the one next to it. So, for example, since red is closer to blue than orange is, red is a cooler color. We can look here and see that since green is closer to our warm line, that Green is a warmer color than blue is. And that idea of comparing colors, warmness or coolness, is the principle of color temperature. So for our first exercise in color temperature, what we're going to do is find the colors that are in between each of these main colors on our color wheel. So for example, we're gonna find the color that's in between red and purple. And because this color here is further away from orange, that means that this is a cooler red. That's the principle of color temperature. We have a red that's warm here, and then we have a red that's cool. And by doing this, you're using your eye to compare two colors and see how they're different in terms of temperature. Now, every time that I'm done mixing a color, I'm gonna wipe off my palette knife on my rag or my paper towel. And the reason I'm doing that is so that I don't contaminate these mixtures. If I were to just keep going with mixing this bluish purple color, then I might accidentally put some red in it and not get the color that I want. So again, you'll see that mixing this, it's gone super duper dark, even darker than this purple that I mixed before. So what I'm gonna do to test it out, to see if it's the color that I want, is take a little bit of it, put a little bit of white in there, and I can use that to gauge how I think I'm doing with getting the color that I want. And I'm happy with that. 
Get that out of the way up here and keep going. Use a lot of paint. We're gonna be going even further with these colors. So you don't wanna find that you don't have enough paint to do more mixtures. And as I'm mixing these, I'm thinking of color temperature. I'm trying to find a color that's right in between the two colors that I'm mixing. Because I'm mixing blue into this green, I'm ending up with a green that is cooler than the main green that we mixed before. Really wipe it off for when you get to these lighter colors. All right, now green and yellow. You find that green is a pretty strong color compared to yellow. So make sure that you've got enough yellow to counteract that. All right, so I've got a green that is warmer than the green I had before because this green has moved along the color wheel and it's getting closer to orange. It's getting closer to the warm colors. And I'm gonna squeeze out a little bit more yellow right now because I know I'm gonna need more later. Yellow and orange together. And then for our last one, orange and red. What's your favorite color? I find that every time I do a new painting, my favorite color changes. If I find something that just has the coolest, bluest purples to it, then I get really excited about those colors, especially when I start mixing ones with more distinction. And then when I move on to my next painting and start paying closer attention to all the different types of oranges that I might be able to get, then orange might suddenly become my favorite color. All right, so what we have here is a more developed color wheel. And by doing this, you are paying closer attention to the specific differences in between these colors. You've got your red and you've got your purple, but now you're looking and seeing that there are actually many, many different colors right in between these two. We don't have just one shade of red. There's thousands of different reds that you could mix. And so now you're training your eye to see in greater and greater detail. The next topic that we're going to discuss is saturated versus desaturated colors. We've got the whole rainbow of colors here mixed together, but out in nature, not every color is as bright as a rainbow. In fact, 99% of the things you're going to paint are not going to be using any of these colors straight up. It would just be too strong. So we have the question, how do we get these colors to look duller or desaturated? For example, the color brown. If you look here, the color brown isn't on the color wheel. This one's starting to look a little closer to brown, but there is no true brown on here. And the way that you get colors like browns or like grays, mimicking the color gold, literally almost any color out there is by desaturating these colors. And to do that, we use the concept of complementary colors. So a complementary color is the color that's exactly opposite of a color on the wheel. So for the color red, its complementary color is green. And if I wanted to take red and start dulling it down, 
what I would do is take that color red and then mix its complement into it. And you'll see that this red doesn't quite have the same sort of uh, sparkle or oomph or vividness as the first red. You can see it even more as you start mixing more green into it. Now we've got a red that is desaturated. We've neutralized this red by mixing the complementary color into it. And so for our next exercise, we're going to create a circle of desaturated colors. So next we'll go into this red orange. And then we're going to mix the greenish blue into it to neutralize. When you're painting, most of the colors you use, you're going to want to be neutralized colors. And the reason for that is because all of us want our paintings to stand out to people. But when everything stands out, then nothing stands out. All of these colors have a contrast. You've heard of contrast probably in terms of like black and white. If something has a lot of really strong white and really strong black, then it's got a lot of contrast. But there's contrast to colors as well. So if I were painting, say, some oranges on a table or something like that, then for the table, for the shadow shape of the orange, for most of the painting, I'm going to want to use colors that are neutralized. That way, when I get to the orange and the light, that's when I pull out my big guns and start using straight up orange, and it'll make it stand out and just sparkle in amazing ways. I want to talk about the idea of pre-mixing your palette when you're starting a painting versus doing a painting and just mixing as you go along. Obviously, different painters do different things. But I think the value of pre-mixing is, number one, you get better at mixing, which means you get better at finding the actual colors that you want to use. But also, you're going to be mixing anyways. So if you get most of your mixing done at the beginning, then you'll have far less to do later. See, I made a big whoops in this, and I forgot how strong that red was. I'm going to put this over here because it's a little bit truer to that. Every paint has its own power to it. But sometimes red can be a very overpowering color. There we go. Well, that's a little better at least. Now our green and our red, this time from the other side. And there's a spectrum here too. If I took this red and put a little bit of green and then more green and then more green and then a lot of green, what you'd see is it would start moving from dull red to even duller red. And then once it passes the center, it would start looking more green. And it'd be a dull green that starts getting more and more vivid. And that's the inside of the color wheel. The stuff on the outside is real strong. Stuff on the inside is less vibrant. And 
And so if you look here, you can see the spectrum of brownish colors. That's how we get our browns. Get a neutralized blue here by mixing its complement, orange. Now look at that, I intermixed. I didn't make enough orange, so I'm gonna have to make a little bit more. That's why it's great to use as much paint at the beginning as you can, because you're gonna use it. Now the difficulty is, I want this orange to be as close as possible to the first one that I mixed. That's pretty tricky to do. But we'll just have to go with that. We've got our, uh, let's see, bluish purple. Finally, purple. Complement to purple is yellow. All right, so now we have a lovely mix of neutralized tones, our browns. I told you these were browns and grays, and that's because when you neutralize a warm tone, what you end up with is browns. When you neutralize a cooler tone, you end up with grays. And you could really tell that once I really neutralize a color, and perhaps lighten it, you'll start seeing how gray it looks. So for example, Let's take a good bit of blue. Bit of orange. And we'll lighten that up. And see how gray that looks compared to these bolder colors on the outside of the circle. The next part of our color mixing lesson is about how to darken and lighten colors. And with learning how to darken and lighten, we get the final step that we need to access every single color out there. The first trick that really opened up this whole new world for us was to learn how to neutralize colors because almost every color in the world is a neutral color. And so the final step then is with every one of these colors, they can go either darker or lighter. And with that, we can get every single color out there. So the artist terminology for a color's darkness or lightness is its value. The color black has the lowest value and the color white has the highest. So for starters, let's look at actually how to mix the color black. Now, like I said in the beginning of our lessons, with just the primary colors, we can mix absolutely any color out there. And that includes the color black. I'm gonna squeeze out a little bit more yellow. I'm running through that yellow like a bad habit. All right, so the color black is an equal mixture of all three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And remember, when I say equal mixture, I don't mean an equal amount necessarily. 
I mean an equal amount of redness, yellowness, and blueness. So if we mix all of these guys together, we get something that starts looking like black. And I'll need to test this out. Again, we're gonna use our old trick of putting a little bit to the side and then mixing some white into it. And if I mix a good black, this should look gray, totally, totally neutralized. And that's looking purple to me, maybe even a little reddish. So how would I neutralize the red and purple tones in this? Well, I'm going to add more of whatever primary color is furthest away. And yellow is the complementary color of purple. So I'll get that purple out of the way. And let's put more yellow into this mixture and we should get something that's closer to black when we do our next test. All right, so let's test this out again. Add a little bit of white. Okay, and to me that's still looking purple. Purple, reddish. So we're gonna wanna go further. Let's get a good hunk more yellow in there. And I'm also gonna put a little bit more blue in there. Do another test. All right, and that's starting to look more gray to me. And you know, I still see what looks like almost an orange tint to this black. So if I wanna neutralize the orange, I would mix more blue in. So that probably means I added too much yellow. Throw some blue in here. A little more in. Hopefully from this I'll get a good black. There we go. That's more like gray. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. So we got black by mixing the three primary colors together. And we would consider black to be in the very center of the color wheel because it's a totally neutralized color. It's as neutral as neutral is neutral. Say that three times fast. <laughs> All right, so we talked about how black has the lowest value and white has the highest value but every single one of these colors has a value to it. And if you were to take a snapshot of this, put it on some fancy mode that puts it in black and white, you'd see that some of these colors are lighter than others and others are darker. So every single color has a value. And when you change the value of a color, you're making a totally brand new color. Red is a great example of this. If we take some red and then we add white to it, that raises its value, turns it into a lighter color. And from that, we get the color pink. So we've changed the value of a color and that's gotten us an entirely new color that we can use to paint. So for the next exercise, let's take all of the hues around our color wheel and we're gonna add white to it and make what's called a tint. A tint is when you add white to a color, 
and make it lighter. And we still wanna practice careful seeing when we do this. So what we wanna do is we wanna try and get each of these tints the exact same value. So I want my yellow tint to be the same as my red tint, the same as my blue tint, all the way around. And we'll put these tints on the outside of our circle. Start off by using a pretty light touch when you're adding white, because depending on which color you're using, white can uh, overpower things pretty quickly. I won't need too much to keep this the same value as the others. And as we're doing these tints, this is a good time to do a little posture check. We've been doing a lot of color mixing and Golly, when artists start really paying attention to something, they start hunching. They slouch, and that can do a lot of damage over your body when you're devoting hours and hours to a painting or something. Your arms and your back are precious, precious, precious. And if you're a professional painter, then your arms and your back are, you know, literally your life. So it pays every once in a while, I even set a timer for this. Just make sure that you've got good posture. Sit up straight, try not to crane your neck too much over what you're making. And your body will really thank you for that after you've been doing art for three hours in one day, six hours in one day. Oh man, that can really add up. Now, some of these colors, when you make it into a tint, you'll see that the tint is actually even more vivid than the original color. And that's really the case with these dark colors. Put a little bit of white in and uh, they can really shine. Now, the opposite can happen when you start adding too much white. You may have heard people complain about a painting looking chalky. And what chalky is, is when there's so much white in there that the white has literally robbed all the color out of the painting. That's one of the things about mixing colors is whenever you mix anything, it's going to be more dull than the color you started with. That's just, unfortunately, one of the limitations of paint throw things together and the result was always more dull than the original thing. And so a chalky painting is when there's been so much white added that's stripped out all the color. I'll give you a little example of that. Let's say with, uh, I don't know, let's say with this blue because we have such a lovely, powerful, vivid blue color here. But let's add a whole bunch of white And you'll see that we've lost a lot of the vibrance of the color because of all of this white that we've added. It's kind of tricky when, you know, you might see some really bright, vibrant color out there in the world um, and you just can't match it with paint. Paint, unfortunately, has limitations that you don't see with, uh, I don't know, if you're looking at a television set or something like that. You know, the TV has these uh, bright LEDs, and uh, they can recreate pretty much any color that you see in the world. But paint, on the other hand, is a uh, subtractive color. So paint reflects light, and that's the only reason that we can see these colors is because these materials in the paint are reflecting certain um, spectrums of color back out at us. 
but that means that, you know, unlike, uh, I don't know, the lightness of the sun, when you look at the sun, it's so bright that it hurts your eyes. But even if we take pure white, we can't make a white light that's so bright that it hurts our eyes. That was something that uh, haunted Van Gogh. He really wanted to mix sunlight, and uh, he just couldn't get it because of the limitations of paint. But there are different things that we can do to overcome these limitations and get closer to the goal that we want. So one of the things that we can do to, uh, to get the color we're trying to get is we can look to other tubes of paint. So we got a whole bunch of really beautiful colors here using just red, blue, and yellow. Um, but with these mixtures, I don't know, take a, take a look at this purple, for example, with the uh, tints that I've made of the purple. I think you can imagine a purple that's a lot more vivid than that. So what I can do is I can take a tube of uh, actual purple. So I've got here dioxazine purple. This is really good for the secondary colors because as I said a moment ago, whenever you mix two colors together, it's gonna get more dull. So these secondary colors, orange, green, purple, these can be kind of prone to uh, losing some of their vividness just because they're mixed colors. So I've got a little dab of this dioxazine purple here. I'm gonna add white to it just so you can, I don't know, see the hue. And bam, see, uh, you see that that purple's got a lot more pop vividness to it than um, these mixed purples, which are like, you know, honestly, they almost look kind of gray compared to a pure purple. So that's one thing that you can use to, um, to kind of get the color that you really want to get. But I said that there's, a couple ways that you can handle the fact that um, you can't mix every single color out there in the world with just, uh, you know, primary colors. And the other thing you can do is you can say, well, I can't get every single color out there, but I'm going to work within the restraints of a limited palette. Sometimes working with limitations is, um, number one, a good mode for inspiration. For example, um, you might look at the art of poetry. Poetry is literally limitations. You're saying, I'm only going to uh, end lines in a rhyme, or every single line is going to have a certain cadence. So those things that make poetry unique and different from prose is, um, you know, what makes it shine. And the same thing can be the case with a limited palette. Um, you know, using only certain colors together can create a certain uniformity between all of the colors. And then you consider like, well, if I just wanted to do a painting with only bright colors, then that doesn't leave room for something to really stand out. So both of those options are great options. If there's just a color you want to get and you can't get it by mixing, by all means, there's no rules to this. Buy the, buy the color paint that you want. But for practicing, there is nothing like using a limited palette because it forces you to understand where purple comes from and how to change purple into something that looks more red, that looks desaturated. And to show you what's possible with a limited palette, 95% of the paintings that I make are done with just yellow, red, and blue, and, and of course white. And the number one thing that people say when they look at my art is that it's really colorful. So the limitations aren't that great, and sometimes a little bit of limitation can be good inspiration. Okay, so we've gone around and made tints of all of our different hues. So we've practiced going lighter, but we also have to ask the question, how do we make a color darker? Now, a lot of these mixtures, you'll notice, actually are very dark. So the answer a lot of times to getting a darker color 
is by mixing primaries together. See, the super dark purple was made by just mixing this red and this blue together. And oftentimes we're not going to need a, a color that's much darker than that. In fact, it's almost impossible to go darker than that. But say we're talking about, um, I don't know, our tint right here of a uh, yellow-orange with a bunch of white mixed in. Say we want to make that color darker. Um, I think most people would assume that to go dark, you add black to it. But that's actually not what we want to do. And the reason for that is, think about what black is. Black is red, blue, and yellow. So, if I want to make a darker version of this yellowish orange, do I want to add red, blue, and yellow to it? What will happen then is that this color will not only get darker, but it'll lose almost all of its vibrancy because red and blue mixed together is purple, which is, you know, basically the complementary color to this. So, we'll end up with a pretty yucky brown pretty quick if we do that. So what our option is then is to make a color darker, we want to mix in a color that's as close as possible to the color we have and a color that is darker in value than the one we're looking at. So remember, every single one of these colors has its own value and value is what we're changing when we want to make something dark. So we're already looking at a darker color of this mixture. Right here is literally a darker version of this light yellow orange. So if we wanted to go darker than this, what we could do is we could mix some yellow and some orange into it. And take a look here. Because this orange is a darker value by far. And then, oops, I was pulling from the tint some yellow and ooh, we're gonna need way more yellow than that see my orange mixture from earlier is nothing even close to the one I had before that's giving me trouble now so anyways it's not perfect but there we go we have a darker version of this yellow orange and what we did to do that is we took colors that were as close as possible to it and had lower values and we mixed those in. So I just want to say one more thing about lightning colors before we leave this section of the lessons. And that's, um, we talked about how lightning, um, we obviously added white to make all of these tints here but sometimes adding white isn't always the best way to do things. The reason for that is because, as we've seen, mixing white in can really pull a lot of the color out of it. And another thing about adding white is that it actually pulls your mixture blue a little bit, which another way to express it in our language is that um, white cools down the color, moves it more towards this side of things. So when you're mixing a lighter color, you just need something that has a lighter value. And there are actually cases where sometimes you may want to use a little bit of yellow in addition to white in order to uh, preserve some of the warmth of the colors. So a good example of that would be with our greens. Let's take a, a pure green and see how with this tint, that I've created of it, it does look a little bluish, at least to me. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but to me it looks a little bluish. So if I wanted a light green that was more true to actually light green, I could take white and let's take a tint of this yellow as well. Mix those together. And then see how that green is um, a little bit warmer than that blue. You could say that this warmer green might be um, a little bit of a truer version of what this would actually look like if it were lighter. Add a little bit more 
white into that too. There we go. So that's just another thing to know. When you're lightening, you're putting in any color that has a higher value. And um, that's not just white. In some cases, yellow might be a good choice. That's the case with red too. Sometimes mixing in yellow instead of white can keep the red from going as chalky as you lighten it up. So looking here, we have a whole palette of colors to choose from, just from the primary colors that we started with. We've got our hues right here, going all around. And then we have desaturated browns and grays. And then we have tints of our hues on the outside. And this is a fantastic starting point for making a painting. These can be great guideposts to already starting pretty close to the color that you're trying to match. Now we did all of this mixing as exercises, but I would suggest doing mixing like this before every painting that you do, especially these hues and the tints. Maybe these desaturated colors might be um, overkill or maybe not. Maybe that'll be helpful for you too, to see some dual colors to start off with. But mixing like this is a great way to start off a painting. And one of the great things about using a lot of paint to mix is that you can do this mixing and then maybe do three paintings of the same subject. And then all that mixing time is taken care of just once and you have three paintings that you can knock it out. So now that we've gone through all of these color mixing principles, it's time to put them to action and do some color matching. So I have three subjects and I'm going to try to match the color of those subjects using the principles of color matching. With color matching, there's three steps that I'm going to take and I'll be cycling through them until I get the color that I want. So step one, I'm going to try to match the hue of the subject. So that's the color of the rainbow that it's closest to. Next, I'm going to try to match the saturation, which is the vividness or dullness of the item. And then finally, I'm going to try to match the value, the lightness or darkness. So my first subject is gonna be this creamy peanut butter. <laughs> And I want to match the peanut butter color, so that's what I'm going for. So step one of this is to look at this and try to decide what color of the rainbow is that closest to. It's obviously a brown, and I'm going to say it's kind of a yellowish, orangish brown. So to start off, we'll get a yellowish, orangish hue. Put that in here. At this point, it doesn't look anything like that at all. But let's start neutralizing this and we'll see if we can't get closer to the actual color. So we want to look for the complement to yellowish orange. And the complement is uh, bluish purple. So our bluish purple is right here. I'll put a little bit in there and try and neutralize this color. And yeah, that's already getting us a lot closer. You can test it by holding up your palette knife to the subject that you're painting. And ideally you want those to be in kind of the same light as each other. So here with our test, let's see, looks like I've got the rainbow color about right. And uh, looks like I've got the lightness or darkness just about right too. But it looks like right now my mixture might be too vivid in color. So that means that I'm gonna wanna neutralize some more. Take some more blue-purple. Now note that whenever I'm adding blue-purple in, I am changing the value a little bit too, making it darker. So I might need to compensate for that later too. Hold this up, and look, it's already too dark now. So let's add some white.
and let's do our color check. So it looks like our mixture is a little bit too green. And if we want it to look less green, then we want to mix in the warm spectrum of colors into that. So let's take a little bit more orange. Put that into our mixture. Compare. And we're getting pretty close. I think it's still a little bit too green though. So let's take our tint of the orange. That way we're not going to change the value as much because we're mixing orange and white together. Do a comparison. And ooh, that looks pretty dang close to me. So we followed three steps to get this color. The hue, the saturation, and the value. Moving on to our next subject. I don't mean to brag, but I have been working out a lot lately. So I thought we might use one of my dumbbells for the next model. Don't let it scare you. I am strong, but I'm also very sensitive. Okay, so we want to mix dumbbell purple. And step one is matching the hue. This is pretty purple with maybe a little bit of red in it. So we'll start off with purple. Maybe put a little bit of reddish purple in there. Mix that together. Saturation, uh, it's kind of hard for me to tell. I know that as I mix white, stuff's going to get real desaturated. So I don't think I'm going to mix any of the complement into this color yet. I'm gonna move on to stage three, which is the value. We're gonna lighten this. You can see just mixing white has desaturated the color quite a lot. Do a little color check, and whoo, that's pretty dang close. I think uh, we might need to push a little bit more red than that. So I'll put a little bit more reddish purple in. I think we're there. Another check. Yeah, that looks closer. All right, so we've mixed dumbbell purple. So our final subject is going to be this lovely bluish greenish pumpkin. And looking at this color wheel here, I can already see some bluish greenish tones that look pretty dang close to that. And that's one of the benefits of pre-mixing before you go, is it takes a lot of the work out of finding the color. Now you could certainly just take red, blue, and yellow and get to the right color. But pre-mixing in advance a little bit can, um, can make your job a little bit easier. So looking here, I can already tell that a bluish greenish hue is what we're going to need. And I already have one that's desaturated. I even have one that's lightened, but I have to mix something for this. That way you can, I have to give myself a little bit of work on this one. So I've lightened. And remember, every time I lighten with white, I am gonna lose some of the color. So if I try to match this lightness perfectly, it's gonna look gray by the time I get there. I'll add a little bit more, but that goes into one of the things you can do to uh, keep from getting too chalky, is I can intentionally paint this pumpkin darker than it actually is. If I shift all the values on my subject to a lower value, then I can keep some of the color that I'm really gonna need so people can look at that and say, wow, what a vivid blue-green pumpkin. So let's compare this. And look at that, that is pretty dang close to some of the darks in this pumpkin. And this would probably be the color I would wanna use for the lights of this pumpkin. 
That way it looked colorful by the time I'm done painting. So for these darks, I would shift them down a little bit as I was matching those colors. So there you have it. That is the process of doing color matching with your mixed palette. Step one, match the rainbow, the hues. Step two, match the saturation. And step three, match the value. Put those together, cycle through them as often as you need until you get the color that you want. Thank you so much for learning alongside me today. The more you practice mixing and matching these colors, the sharper your eye is going to get at detecting these small differences. I encourage you to pre-mix your colors before you start a painting. A color wheel like this is an incredible starting point for painting. I would love to see your mixed palette. Please take a picture of it and tag me on Instagram at kyle.heath.art. Everyone in our little group is learning together to see with a sharper eye. Thanks again, bye bye for now, and happy painting.